I was doing a workshop and, and, uh, for um, geriatrics, and um, geriatrics, isn't that a nice word? Uh, it's, it's supposed to um, evolve individuals, which is how the culture see it. And <clears throat> I was just kidding around, and I've never done that again. And, and this very old <laughs> <yeah> <laughs> man comes in and he says, what, what is this workshop about? I said, I said, the psychology of good sex. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. But <laughs> then he called two friends and they showed up. <laughs> <laughs> But it was just about, you know, boring psychology at the time. So anyway, getting back to this, <laughs> you have to be able to, to accept the moment that you are in chaos. So you have to say, okay, I accept what I'm feeling now. My, my pulse is, is racing, my, I'm, I'm, I'm perspiring, um, pupils die, uh, constrict, all kinds of things are going on. So you acknowledge that, and then you take a deep breath and accept it. And the reason for doing that is that um, I do a lot of work with Tibetan Buddhist psychology and, and their psychology is about 2,000 years, 1,800 years old and ours is 110. So I think we can learn a little bit about them. We know a lot about cognitive science and how to operationalize things. We don't know anything about the evolved emotions. They have tomes and tomes of, compa and of uh, in, uh, the subject of compassion, empathy, inclusive compassion. We have done, there was a survey that was done in psychology about uh, what we talk about and write about and study. And there had been in the last 15 years about 10,000 articles in depression, about 8,000 articles in psychosis, uh, about 500 in um, love, and about two in compassion uh, and, and, and science. 500, that's, you know, that's as opposed to 10,000. They're beginning to do more of that. So you have to be able to accept what you feel and what the Tibetan lamas uh, teach, and uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhist psychologists, is very different than our modern cognitive science and medicine. Our belief in, in Western thinking is that when you store a memory, it's a traumatic memory, and you bring it up, your breathing changes because you're bringing up the memory. Tibetan Buddhist psychology has a different way of looking at it, which I think is more correct. They say that you store the, the, the thought, the sensation, the emotion, and the breathing pattern. And that's the glue. The breathing pattern is the mind-body. It's the only mechanism that we have that is conscious and not conscious. So when you bring up a memory, you're bringing up the signature breathing of the memory. And the way to break it, you go, and it unglues it, and then it allows you to discover. So when you go into shock, chaos, so accept what it is, because what happens when you go into chaos, all negative memories start coming up because you, you archive things. When I'm in danger, this reminds me of when I was in danger and such and such. So all kinds of things come up without you being aware of it. So what you, you, I acknowledge how your body feels, acknowledge what you're thinking, acknowledge what you're feeling, and then breathe it so it'll unglues it. It unglues the, uh, the containment, and then you can go into discovery. If you don't do that, what you'll do is you'll deny, and you create, you create a denial signature, which is, for example, what causes a lot of illnesses that are predisposed genetically, like uh, cancer and, and other kinds of problems, under immunity is, is a form of denial, it's a form of holding back and, and, and repressing. Because you don't allow the fear and all the processes to come out and, and, and express. And one example is uh, that I was talking to this, uh, someone earlier about how uh, endorphins, you hear about endorphins, they're so good and it's, you get endorphin high. Well, nothing is good when it's too much. And what uh, some of the uh, work uh, that they're doing with diabetes research are finding that uh, the diabetic, uh, diab diabetic profile, there's a lot of control issues, a lot of anger, control, trying to keep the world within a certain amount of order, and uh, suppression of emotions, of negative emotions. They come out and then they're suppressed or they're, they're denied. And in order for you to be able to deny emotions, the body will secrete a tremendous amount of endorphins to anesthetize you from emotions. But then that high level of emotions uh, will cause the endorphins, of course, to go up, and then high levels of endorphins begins to conflict with the, uh, with the levels of glucose, and glucose also goes up. So um, you see that, that if, you, if you deny something, there's a physiological consequence for denying something. The body will say, okay, you want to deny it? I, I have to then do something to keep the pain away, so it begins to shoot out endorphins. People who commit suicide, violent suicide, have very high levels of endorphin when they do an autopsy because it's a, pr a way of protecting yourself from, from yourself. And, and when you see predators and victims running, 
just before the, the predator is going to bite the, the victim, or the, the, the zebra or whatever, you see that they give up. That's physiological helplessness. And when they give up, they secrete a tremendous amount of endorphins. Nature protecting you from the pain of the bite. See? But so, some people live in constant state of victimhood and, and, and uh, helplessness, so you're constantly anesthetizing yourself to all kinds of things, good and bad, at an expense to your body and to your health. So you, you, you have to navigate nature, because if you don't, it'll protect you in the wrong way. You're not going to be able to see what you don't want to see. And, and it even works, this mind-body thing works even with sociopaths who think that they don't feel anything. There was a, a man who had a, a, a subcutaneous hematoma. He had some, some blood here in his elbow. And he went to the doctor and they checked it out and they couldn't figure it out. They cleaned it and came back the next month the same time, third time, fourth time. So finally, there was a pathologist who had read this very obscure article about someone who had sympathetic uh, menstruation, which means that you would identify with the menstruation of your partner. So the doctor came back and said, do you, do you have any, you know, does this correlate law, uh, at all with your wife's uh, menstruation? And he said, no, not at all. And he said, oh, but wait a minute. Um, he, he said, do you find any connection at all? He said, yeah, my wife and I and my best friend and his wife went to Bermuda and I had an affair with her, but I do that all the time. Uh, and, <laughs> and her menstruation, it correlates with, with my uh, uh, hematoma, but I don't think it has anything to do with it. Well, <laughs> Anyway, he never came back to the doctor and everything was fine. But the nice thing about it, the funny thing about it is there was this man in the audience and he went like this and he looked at his elbow. <laughs> I wish I could have videotaped that because it would have been a great, you know, lesson for... <laughs> so even if you think you're denying something, your body will speak for you. Because it's a mind-body code that's there. And it'll, it'll, it'll always speak to you. So once you identify the, the chaos, then you accept it and you do the breathing and then move on to discovery. Go from validation to discovery mode. And you notice when you go somewhere, you've never been there, uh, you go to, from A to B. On the way up, it feels longer than on the way back because you, you're trying to, you're train, your brain is trying to validate. It has nothing to validate. It has no cues of familiarity. Then when you come back, your brain immediately picks up on a post and this and that, and that compresses time in your perception, and you think that it's shorter. So you see, you, but what, so what you want to do is when you go to a new place, go into discovery, and then come back with validation, because you've already seen it. So you validate, but don't go with validation into discovery, because one, time will feel longer, and two, you'll miss all kinds of things that you can learn, but it'll keep you hypervigilant, because you're your nervous system is, is trying to run on something that, that, that's not uh, to be run. It's nothing to validate because it's new. So it's very important to be able to learn how to go from one to the other.